And um, for folks who are on the call now, um, you should have just gotten a notification that this meeting is going to be recorded. Um, so just want to make sure to let you all know that. Um, I want to introduce myself. My name is Michelle Lucas. I am a member of the Access to Justice Board, and our chair, Terry Price, is unavailable today. So I've been bestowed with the great responsibility of chairing today's meeting. Uh, so thanks all for being here. And we will do um, a quick round of introductions for folks who are new to, AT to Access to Justice Board meetings. But first, I want to make an introduction to one of our, to our newest board nominee. Um, Jeremiah Bourgeois, and I, I don't know if Jeremiah wants to, I, I hope I pronounce your last name correctly. I'm sorry, I didn't think that through. Um, and I, if, you have a, if you have anything you want to say, if you want to introduce yourself, please please take a minute if you'd like. Sure, Jeremiah Bourgeois, uh, go by JJ. I'm a Gonzaga Law student, uh, third year, graduate in December. Uh, I'm impacted currently work with the Freedom Project trying to increase access to justice for people who have been impacted by a, well, not too recent state Supreme Court decision regarding uh, drug possession. And uh, I'm happy to be here. Thanks, JJ. And then um, I wanna take the first few minutes. I know people are still coming in, but I wanna give folks an opportunity if this is um, your first time in the space, your first access to justice board meeting to introduce yourself. Um, we love cameras if you wanna, you wanna show us your face, but if you wanna let us know who you are, um, feel free. Do we not have new people? Anybody? I, I I I can't remember. I can't. Oh, hi. I'm new. My name is Laura Berry. I'm uh, just in my second week now with LFW, um, Legal sure. Foundation of Washington, um, and I just joined the team there as the new annual campaign director. And um, because it's week two, I'm not going to be too useful with reporting on anything from LFW today, but I will have a lot of affirmative nods for my colleagues who do. So <laughs> let them be the experts today. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Welcome. You. Um, is there anyone else that wants to take a moment to introduce themselves? Um, I'm Mariah Hanley. I am sitting in from the Attorney General's Office of Military and Veteran Legal Assistance. Hi, Mariah. We are happy to have you. Hi, glad to be here. Can I'll try to let it sit in silence for another another 10 seconds in case anybody else wants to introduce themselves if this is their first access to justice board meeting. Sounds like no, so we are gonna um, move on. I wanna do a few quick um, board announcements before we before we start hearing from other folks. Um, so one thing I just wanna remind people is that we are currently collecting proposals for the Access to Justice Conference. Uh, the deadline for those proposals is March 24th. So it's coming up faster than you expect it to. And uh, the theme this year is shifting justice towards accountability and trust. Um, and the conference itself is going to be in Tacoma, uh, September 28th to the 30th. It will be um, in, in person in Tacoma, and then some of the sessions will also be available online. So get us those proposals. We'd love to see what you all have to, um, what, you know, we, all the information that we want to share with the community. And um, the next announcement is that next month, the board meeting will actually be held in Wenatchee. Um, so every uh, every year, um, barring a global pandemic that kept us from traveling, uh, we try to have two meetings outside of King County. And so we will be in Wenatchee from April 27th to 28th. We are going to be having a public session on the morning of April 28th um, that will be available for people to ret attend remotely as well. So one business matter, one set. So moving on to the next agenda item. We have one business matter to do, which is just the, um, the it's actually the January minutes because there was no public session in February, um, but is included in the meeting materials were the 
were the minutes from our January 27th board meeting. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? I'll move to approve. I'll second. Thank you. Okay. Um, so all in favor of approval of the January minutes? I think that was, let's see, Vanna. Um, oh, perfect. Thanks, Vanna. Um, any, any opposed, anyone opposed? And any abstentions? Did I, should we have discussed it? Sorry, <laughs> were there any edits? <laughs> no, but, I, but I think technically, given that Jeremiah is not on the board yet, he can't second that motion. So I'm sorry, Jeremiah. <laughs> uh, Thank you, Your Honor. So how about how about the minute? How about the minutes for this meeting reflect that I seconded the motion to approve the minutes? Thanks, Judge Keenan. <laughs> um, but I think we had all approvals and um one more to check. Any any oppo no opposals, no abstentions. Looks good. Thanks, everybody. Okay, um, so moving on to the next agenda item is the an up, a quick update on the OCLA Director Search Committee. Um, Esperanza Barboa was unable to be with us today, but um, Mike Chin has graciously volunteered to step in to give this update. Great, thanks, Michelle. Um, so as most of you know, that um, our the, the current Jim Bamberger will be. Um, retiring from his position. And so uh, the Access to Justice Board, our role um, asked by the Supreme Court uh, and also by the rules is to go forward with a search process and to submit names to the Supreme Court for this process. And so just a quick update, uh, we had our first meeting about a couple of weeks ago and we were supposed to have a second follow-up meeting to discuss requests for proposals yesterday, but that meeting had been moved to Monday. Um, in terms of members, um, there the member of makeup of this board, there are, hold on, let me get the correct numbers here, three members of the Access to Justice Board, which includes Terry, who is our chair, um, also myself, and Espy, who um, will be kind of representing the ATJ board. There are also three members from the Civil Legal Aid Oversight Committee, two members from the Access to Justice board's community advisory and a designee from the OCLA staff to serve as a non-voting member. Uh, so we are moving forward with this process. Um, we, um, the Supreme, um, Justice Gonzalez has asked for names to be submitted by, I think, mid-November. So this process is moving quickly and we are in the process right now of, we've already have kind of reviewed the job description and we'll be moving forward with the request for proposals for a, um, a, a firm to assist us in that recruitment process. So hopefully that's a quick update as to where we are. If folks have questions, feel free to reach out to myself, SB or Terry and we'll be happy to have one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations for those that may have. Yes, oh, there's a couple questions. Yeah, I just had a quick question if now is the right time to ask. Sure. Okay, yeah. uh, thanks Mike, uh, um, that's helpful. I looked at the materials and I was curious about the composition of the committee and representation for like VLPs, uh, smaller specialty providers and uh, funders like LFW and how that how they would have a voice in the process. Um, that's a great question. I was added last to you know as part of this process, but that a good question that I will probably have to defer to Terry. I do know that there is a uh, co-chair of this uh, search committee, Sarah Augustine. Um, so maybe Terry or Sarah could possibly answer that question, but that's a great question. Um, I actually was hoping to go to my first meeting yesterday and it got moved to Monday, but I was kind of a, a last step in, a last add on to this. So great question. Yeah. And and not, sorry to interrupt you, Mike. I think I would just note, like, I think we're happy to hear the questions and take them down. I can't guarantee what kind of answers we can give today because Terry's yeah. not, uh, Terry's on the committee, but I think we do want to get those questions and we can try to get responses to you all. Yep. I think um, Abigail has had a question. Hi, thanks, Michelle. Um, so 
Cesar's not here, um, unfortunately, and he's sent his apologies, but he was contacted by Terry to be one of the provider members of the search committee. Um, and so we're, we're excited about that development and hopefully that means, and like following up on Murph's question, that that means that other providers um, will also be involved as part of the selection committee. So just wanted to throw that in there. It seems that it's contemplated by the Supreme Court's letter. So really appreciate everyone's attention to that, thanks. And Caitlin? Uh, hi, thank you. Um, I, uh, I, my comment is also related to, to what Murph and Abby said. Um, I, did, I, I really appreciated the memo that came out from Terry and the, the search committee uh, earlier this week kind of outlining the process. And I too noted that um, there is a dedicated slot on the committee for a voting member who is a provider of civil legal aid with substantial experience. Um, according to how I read the memo, it looked like there was only one contemplated at this point, although I, I am hopeful that there could be other voices from the community of providers and clients who could, who could be included at some point also. Um, so thank you. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, any additional questions or comments on that topic before we move on? And again, I know that we don't have a lot of answers, so I apologize that it's yeah. not a robust discussion right now. Um, one, one thing I'd like to ask, Michelle, if it's possible for, uh, for those who do have questions about that, if you could either email Terry um, or you can also email me with those specific questions because we are convening, we are meeting on Monday. And so I think these questions, since we're just starting off the process, it would be helpful to hear your feedback and for us to uh, discuss that at our Monday meeting. So please, um, if you can send that, that would be great. Can you tell me when that Monday meeting is so that I can convey it to my superior? <laughs> yes, it is. Um, it got scheduled for Monday at um, noon. Okay. Yeah, noon. Yeah, it's the uh, Oakland Executive Director search meeting 12 to 1 on Monday, the 13th. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. And thanks, everybody, for your questions and comments. Um, it's a big, it's a big thing. It's a big change um, coming up for legal aid in Washington. So um, next on the agenda, we have 10 minutes set aside, which I don't know if that will be enough time. Um, but um, we have Antonio Giannata here from Columbia Legal Services to give a legislative update. It should be enough time, I hope, but I hope we have questions uh, because I'm not sure what everybody wants to check in on, but I'll give you my general sense of where we're at on day 61. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Antonio. I'm the policy director at Columbia Legal Services. Um, as I mentioned, we're in the 60th day. It's sort of like we just had the halfway point. Um, just on Wednesday, which is the floor cutoff. Um, that means that if a bill did not move um, by last by Wednesday, unless it's absolutely necessary to implement the budget, it's pretty much dead. So, so really on day 61, the update is, I don't know what's gonna happen, but I know it's not gonna happen. Um, and I can run through a lot of the great ideas that haven't, um, that didn't make it to cut off. Um, Unfortunately, I think it's all a bit unsurprising, though. Um, we had lots of signals from the legislators um, during the interim what they wanted to focus on and what they didn't want to focus on. We had forewarning. We had concerns about, uh, you know, the budget was might be a little there might be a little uptick in this biennium, but there was going to be a downfall. So there, there was a lot of being conservative about new big projects. There was signaling that they, the investments were going to focus on housing, uh, but they weren't going to focus on any kind of major systemic criminal legal reform. Um, so, for example, we knew in the interim exactly which bills were going to get introduced related to whether there was going to be a, a recriminalization or a continued criminalization of personal drug possession. Um, or decriminalization, we knew who would sponsor those bills and we knew which bill would move forward. That's exactly what happened. It was Senator Robinson's bill that continues to keep personal drug possession as a gross misdemeanor. Um, and the decriminalization bill sponsored by Senator Dingra did not move forward. 
We knew that was going to happen. We knew that big ticket items, like I mentioned, things that were new particularly weren't going to make it. And a lot of those new things didn't make it. Uh, one of those things was one of the things we were working on at CLS, which was a creating an unemployment system for undocumented workers, a state funded system. Um, once the uh, the uh, the fiscal note came out, that was about a hundred million dollars um, per biennium with forty new FTEs at the Employment Security Department. Once we saw that thing. Uh, we knew it was on the chopping block, and it was. Um, the solitary confinement bill got a fiscal note of $85 million. That one didn't make it. The expansion of working families tax credit didn't make it. The bill that addressed properly paying incarcerated workers, it originally had a fiscal note of $270 million. That's what DOC makes um, for by, by, by <laughs> uh, not paying people who are incarcerated workers. Um, that bill was cut down to a fiscal note of about seven million. Still didn't make it. Um, the baby bonds bill, so the Washington Future Fund bill, uh, that had a hundred and forty million dollar fiscal note that didn't make it. So uh, <laughs> um, they have the legislators have set the stage for chopping a lot of these new proposals and saying they needed to wait. Um, and now we we wait. Uh, until March 20th, which is when the revenue forecast comes out and when we actually have a better sense of what the actual numbers are and the budgets should be coming out just you know that day, the next day, depending on what the revenue forecast says, then we'll have a better sense of what might actually happen. Um, I did want to just flag a couple of things that um, we're working on that might be of interest um, to you. Um, I don't know if you've seen in the papers, a lot of the landlord bills that the issues related to potentially reducing, um, uh, in, 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 uh, increasing the amount of time the notice required before a landlord can raise the rent on someone, that bill didn't make it, nor did the one that that created sort of uh, caps on the amount of rents, uh, the, the on rent increases, that was House Bill 1389. Those are the big sort of landlord tenant bills that we would have liked to have seen. They didn't make it across. The one that did was the landlord damage claims bill. This is House Bill 1074. Um, CLS, it, it, the Northwest Justice Project identified it as an issue of concern five, six years ago. Um, and we've been working on that bill uh, for about five years now. This is the first time we got across the, we got out of the house uh, which is super exciting, um, and so this is the year for 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 addressing the 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 issue of unsubstantiated damage claims or excessive damage claims by landlords. Um, the problem is is that there's no other RLTA bill out there, and so now all the landlords are going to focus their you know their fire uh, power on this bill. So it's going to get a lot of attacks uh, between now and the end of session, but we're going to work hard. We think we, we're, this is the year to do it. And there's uh, there's lots of history there. At least it, it is not a new program. Legislators are now, you know, socialized that this is a, an issue that needs to take uh, uh, pace and take attention. Um, Chair Cooter in Senate Housing has scheduled the, the bill already next week, plus a work session on issues related to transparency around damage claims. So. Just flagging, this is a this is a, a key priority for ours. I see Judge Keenan on the call, um, House Bill 1169, which is another bill to build on our LFO reforms from last year, um, is still moving. Uh, this is a bill that would uh, originally would have eliminated a couple of fees, the DNA fee and the vic uh, the victim protection assess victim penalty victim penalty assessment. Excuse me. Um, the bill's been modified a bit to. To instead of eliminating them, uh, creating a, an indigency standard review to see um, whether people would have to pay them. So there would have to be a, you know, a Blazina look at whether those fees are payable. Um, there's going to be some a merger of some juvenile fine and fees issues into that bill, um, but it is another good LFO reform bill that's moving forward. Um, so those are two of the bills that are still on our priority list. We are pushing along with a very large coalition um 
the issue related to health equity for immigrants to making sure to create a state funded Medicaid equivalent program for people who are not eligible for Medicaid due to their immigration status. Um, the, the trick with that bill, unfortunately, is that it has a very uh, a large fiscal note. Um, and so we've got to figure out what can be funded in the budget. Um, there's been estimates that go between um, it could cost 40 million a year to 300 million a year. So those are big numbers. Um, so we'll have to see where we are uh, once the budgets come out and once the revenue forecast comes out. Okay, uh, how long how did I do? Um, I did less than 10 minutes. Uh, any questions on any particular bills that I can uh, help with? Is there a number for the health equity bill? Michael, there isn't. Thanks for asking. There, there was a originally there was a plan to run a policy bill, but the decision by the legislators was to to get it into the budget um, and then run a policy bill later. Um, so not have a floor fight on this issue. Um, this is a strategy that has worked in the past related to Apple Health for Kids, for example, was the same way that was done. So that was the strategy. So no, there's it, it'll be just in the budget. There is no policy bill. Uh, Antonio, uh, any thoughts or any uh, information about HB uh, 5064 expanding uh, legal representation uh, to post-conviction proceedings? The, the post-conviction so council, the great flag, JJ, yeah, that, that we, that's on our support list. And um, that bill, like so many bills, got narrowed. It, it was it originally created a, a right to the first, uh, uh, you know, collateral attack. Um, and now what it does is 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 allows for one if there's funding. So the way the language is written, it's not guaranteed and there's gonna be a, a funding, you know, there's, there's gonna be a fund monies appropriated for it. And once those get exhausted, then it won't exist anymore. But I, you know, in the way this legislature has been working this year, I think this is still a very positive step to get it in there. Um, and so, so yes, we're definitely supporting that as it moves forward, Senator Saldana's bill. Thanks, JJ. Um, Bryn? Hi, Antonio. I had a quick question. I, if I understood correctly, it sounds like you said we wait until March 20th about the revenue forecast. Does that include capital gains revenue? And what is sort of the it's a great plan question? On, Super great question. I I um, yeah. And, and I mentioned bills are dead unless they are necessary to implement the budget. Well, guess what? Like just yesterday, there was a hearing on the wealth tax. The first hearing in the Senate, even though we've missed a cutoff date, that is going to be necessary to implement the budget. So um, on capital gains and other revenue developments, um, I would call those conversations are happening in a black box that we cannot sort of get into. Um, they are um, very secretive as to what the majority party wants to do in terms of raising revenue and which direction they are going to go. So we will know that when they reveal the budget, when they when they say to fund all of, for example, these housing investments and and, and put money into the housing trust fund, we're going to need to um, uh, create a wealth tax, for example, and and so that will be the signal. We don't know that yet, and those decisions have not been made yet. I mean, publicly, <laughs> um, I think they have been made uh, by legislators. They're just not sharing that yet. Other questions? Thanks for everything you're doing, everybody. Good to see you. Thank you so much, Antonio. Um, I appreciate that um, digest of all of the stuff that's going on in Olympia. Um, okay, so moving on to the next agenda item, um, we have a liaison report from Bryn Felix. Um, so I'll toss it to Bryn. Thanks, Michelle. Hi, everybody. I'm Bryn Felix, uh, co-chair of the Legal Aid Funders and Communicators, or LAFCO, uh, committee. My new co-chair is the honorable, and not, not actually judge, but I think she's awesome, Laura Berry. Um, so we had Natalia Fior, who had been serving as LFW's annual campaign director, um, departed in December, um, as Laura introduced herself this morning. Really excited to work with her, um, and we'll be having our first LAFCO meeting co-chairing together uh, this coming Thursday, 
March 16th from 12 to 1. Now, backing up a little bit for folks who are new, uh, the goal of LAFCO is to have a gathering space where fundraisers, developers, and communication professionals in the legal aid space can get together and do some peer sharing um, and you know news gathering and such. We meet every other month. Our November meeting focused on annual campaign strategies and you know, end of year asks. Our January meeting featured Doug Honig, who's the former communications director at the ACLU of Washington, gave a fabulous presentation on tips uh, to speak with the press and how to develop and publish op-eds that are strategic and impactful. Um, so our upcoming meeting will be sort of a part two now that we've got this presentation about how to speak effectively with the media. It's going to be more of a small group um, breakouts about what folks' experiences have been. Um, again, strategies on what went well, what hasn't gone well, um, and how can we get our, our message out in different kinds of media. So if you're interested in um, participating, offering your own perspectives or just listening to what others have to say, um, we'd love to have you. And again, Laura, really excited to be working with you um, as the LAFCO co-chair. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Bryn. Thanks, Bryn. Anybody have any questions for, for Bryn? Or... I'm very bad at like waiting a few seconds to let people talk. I'm trying very hard. But it looks like no. So uh, the next agenda item is actually liaison updates for me. Um, I'm the Access to Justice Board liaison for both the Small Town and Rural Practice Committee uh, and to the Pro Bono Council. I just have a very brief um, update for the Small Town and Rural Practice Committee. And I don't know if anyone on the call right now is from that committee. But what I, what I will share is that um, there is a rural practice job fair that's uh, kind of going on right now. It is in process. It's being organized by uh, the STAR Committee and hosted by Gonzaga Law School. Um, for those who work statewide, um, y'all know that it's really hard to hire in different places. Oh, and there's Kari, so I can give Kari a few minutes to talk to if she wants to give any updates. But, um, but there is a job fair that's going on and I will put the link in here. Oh, and Murph is here too. I'm sorry, there's a lot of people on the call. <laughs> um, but um, registration for those who are for employers is open until the 13th. So you got a few more days. Um, applications are due on the 15th. Um, so I just wanted to share that out, um, really promote it because there are really great opportunities and that they're outside of the bit larger metropolitan areas. And so I don't know if anybody else from that committee wants to. Um, wants to chime in and give any other updates. I would say that's the biggest thing going on right now, Michelle, thanks for the update. And the notices have been going out on many listservs about the job fair. Um, there's over 40 employers that from small and rural towns that have uh, posted job postings. And we have quite a number of um, people interested in having an interview and we hope to continue this in the years to come and we'll see how it grows and many thanks to Lori Powers she's the person at Gonzaga who's really been the person spearheading this huge momentous event and um, it's going to be on March 31st um, is when the interviews are going to be taking place. Thank you. And I just dropped a link with some additional information into the chat too. Um, and then also uh, for the pro bono and public service committee uh, liaison update, I'm actually just going to gonna ask Michael to do that. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> yeah, hi everyone. Uh, pro bono council, not pro bono public service committee. That's another committee. Um, <laughs> no problem. Um, I, I only had one thing I really wanted to highlight. Uh, some of you may know their before the pandemic, there was an in-person large kind of intro to family law, family law basic CLE um, that happened, I think, every year. It, I'm not sure if it was usually in, in Longview, but it is uh, back in Longview, um, coming up pretty soon. 
the Kellis will kind of come legal aid has uh, traditionally been a big part of that. And so we are pleased to be able to offer um, free tuition to this kind of two day in person, pretty big uh, training uh, for any new um, family law hopeful practitioners. Uh, you get the free tuition. Uh, the only catch is that you do have to volunteer with one of the VLPs to get that free discount code. Uh, so we'll be sending that out on the listserv probably pretty soon. Um, it'll allow people from all over the state to go into Longview and participate. It's a really great program. I think the first day is all uh, nuts and bolts stuff. And the second day is practical um, court skills in front of judges with real feedback. Uh, so it's a really great opportunity. Uh, and you should be able to uh, volunteer to get your free admission uh, anywhere in any of the VLPs. Um, so that's my big announcement. Hopefully, uh, if you're interested, you'll you know share with everyone. Um, we'd really like to get some more, uh, grow that pool of family law volunteers around the state because we need them everywhere. So thanks. Thanks, Michael. Um, does anybody have any questions for Michael about that? We're cruising on this agenda, so don't don't hold oh, back. <laughs> I did post, post something in the chat. It looks like I'm Bonnie, but it oh. was me, Diana. <laughs> the chat's being weird. I was just wondering, is that training in person only, or are there any uh, type of I, I believe there is also a virtual option, um, but I mean, I think people are. I, I think the the emphasis is supposed to be on the in person because I think that's when you're able where you're able to get the the practical uh, court skills training. But I think there is also an in person or a virtual option. Thank you. Any any other questions? Okay. So um next up is um Judge Keenan and Mike Chin with a an Access to Justice Board internal equity process update. Thank you, uh Michelle. Uh, so I'm Dave Keenan. I serve on this internal equity group uh, of the board with Michelle and with, with Mike. Uh, I'm at the state bar right now because I mistakenly came here thinking our meeting was in person. Uh, and so Bonnie gave me a conference room where I'm having a meeting of one um, all by myself. <laughs> so, Kaylin, that's not funny. <laughs> Nobody asked you. <laughs> all right, well. Let me just give you an update on some of our, our work, but I want to back up for a moment and give you a little bit of context. Uh, I think some of you, although if you've been doing this long enough, you won't be surprised to know that the current Supreme Court order that enables the access to justice board's existence does not actually mention race. I suspect if there was another order, uh, it probably would. Um, but if you've been doing this work long enough, you know the 2015 Civil Legal Needs Study uh, called out the racially racially disproportionate impact uh, of the lack of access to civil legal aid in our state. And we know in 2018, we had the statewide plan for the coordinated delivery of civil legal aid to low-income people. And it was centered, literally centered. If you look at the uh, graphic that is in the plan, it's the and there's a circle in the middle that says race equity. Uh, you know, our board uh, had already committed to the Reggie principles, the Washington Race Equity and Justice Initiative. That work should have always been uh, important. It became more urgent uh, for all of us after George Floyd's murder and then the Supreme Court's letter to the legal community calling on all of us to do a lot more. So in 2021, uh, the board uh, tried to strengthen its, its commitment to race equity by really reflecting with the help of consultants uh, on how interpersonal, uh, institutional, and structural racism have affected access to justice. So I don't know if any of you know Kiana Wheeler, uh, but we worked with Kiana uh, initially uh, to continue to learn about uh, race equity on a systemic and an organizational and personal level. We actually, uh, and sometimes we still go back to it. Uh, in fact, I've used it in, a, in other uh, contexts. Kiana helped develop a workbook uh, for us uh, to kind of deepen our, our self-awareness and, and our, I guess we can call it our other awareness. But we didn't want to stop there. So last year, uh, we worked with Just Lead 
Washington to do an organizational assessment to identify some of our, our strengths and areas for improvement. And uh, that was a great process, I think, but it was hard. We had some hard conversation. Um, the, uh, the equity coaches had one-on-one -on -one, uh, candid conversations with every board member uh, and provided a lot of anonymous feedback to the entire board. And this showed a lot of areas for growth uh, around respect for each other and diversity uh, of perspectives, including uh, trust building. So you know, candidly, uh, the work was hard in the sense that uh, we had to have some tough conversations about how much bias impacts our board members and how many board members did not feel, at least at the time, that the board could even reach consensus uh, on applying an anti-racism lens to our decision-making. We're, we're grateful we did this work. We think it's paying off. And so we have this internal equity group that we've had for a little while now. We often update each other at our working sessions, where it's generally just the board. Uh, we wanted to, to talk about this a little bit in the public session today because we think it's important to talk about our work in this space, in part because we're trying to learn, we're trying to lead, but we're also trying to be led, to be in the room, to be at the table, to know when to listen, when to, when to follow, and not dictate. Um, We've struggled at times uh, in particularly, I think, in, in interrupting bias, even among each other uh, and trying to excise a white supremacy culture from the work of the board. And, and so what I mean by that, for example, is not using procedures, not using Robert's rules of order, uh, you know, as a sword and as a, and as a shield, not stifling conversations. Um, uh, we've, I think we've been reluctant at times to call out words and meetings, which whether conscious or not, uh, might be rooted uh, in bias. And in moments like that, we try to return to what we call our community agreements, which just lead equipped us with, um, with the idea that we should expect wel welcome, we should, we should speak our truths, we should let others speak theirs and be okay uh, with non-closure. And then finally, just more recently, the board, as I think many of you know, was excited for the creation of the, the community advisory panel. And that is comprised of individuals with lived experience and they're working to share their insights to help uh, our access to justice community be more responsive. And uh, we've taken that work and really tried to weave it into our uh, recruiting. And we think the, the most recent slate of board members uh, and then hopefully Jeremiah very soon um, reflect that. And we'll be recruiting for two members uh, this year uh, as well. Uh, and you'll hear more from us uh, on that soon as we really try to reach out to the community and find individuals with lived experience, people who can really guide our work forward. Uh, and uh, we think that hopefully this will be reflected in, in uh, the board's efforts to in create an inclusive process for the selection of the next OCLA director, which I think, as we've already seen from some discussion today, is one of the most important decisions that'll be made uh, in our civil legal aid community for, for probably years to come. And we had at our last meeting a great conversation. I don't think Selena is here today, but Selena Salongo, uh, WISPA's Equity and Justice Lead, brought us through some great conversation uh, as well. And we're just continuing to do that work uh, and make sure that not only do we talk about race equity amongst ourselves, but that it we do it publicly and that it translates uh, to action for the communities that we serve. So I'm gonna stop there and see, Michael, do you, is there anything that you'd like to add or Michelle, is there anything that you'd like to add? And then I just wonder if, if there are any questions. No, I, I don't have anything to add, Dave. And I think you did a great job kind of really talking about our journey in this and how do we hold ourselves accountable and how do we hold each other accountable in this journey and that we're continuing to reflect and continue to learn and continue to grow, which I think is part of the process, part of the journey. And so it has been really exciting for me to be part of this journey with all of us as we really evolve and to really think about like, what does it look like a 2.0 ATJ? And what does that look like in the future? And how do we actually serve people better and bring in the racial equity lens to all of the aspects of our work?
Uh, I don't have anything additional to add. Thanks, Judge Keenan. And um, we do have some time. So I do want to invite any questions, uh, comments, if folks, I, I mean, I think that we could take up a whole meeting with with ideas on the ways that we can improve and we'll we'll work on those things. <laughs> but um, but it'd be great to hear from folks about um, just any thoughts that they have in response to um, what Judge Keenan shared. Okay, um, I think that the only thing I would add is that, um, and I and I know Judge Keenan said this. We want to share because we want to um, we want to we want to be transparent. And I think that one thing to recognize is that as the board, we have the board space set aside where we can where we can dedicate time to this work. And I know that in practice, when we're all running around trying to do our jobs and try to do the things that we need to do, it can be really hard to make that space. Um, and make the space and time to have these difficult conversations. So, um, but we hope that people keep doing it. There's always room to grow. And um, yeah, I don't, now I'm just talking. So, okay. Thanks everyone. Um, I think next on the agenda is Alexandra Diaz um, with, with the Equal Justice Coalition update. Thanks. Hi everyone. Um, so I have a fairly short update um, as we're still waiting for budget bills to be dropped. Um, but as many of you already know, and you heard me talk about at the last meeting, uh, this session, the EJC is asking the legislature to fully fund OCLA's 2023-25 biennial budget request. Um, in particular, we're asking the legislature to fund basic civil legal aid services, including a $4.4 million vendor rate adjustment. Um, and that vendor rate adjustment is to protect existing client service delivery capacity at NJP and the subcontracted specialty legal aid providers and VLPs. Uh, so that's really been our main focus this session. Um, and with the help of our lobbyists, we've spent the last couple of months meeting with several legislators about this. And we're now currently waiting, like I said, for the House and the Senate to release those budget bills and see if those efforts were successful. Um, and we're kind of expecting those budgets to be released around March 20th. Um, that's when the forecast update is supposed to happen. So hopefully we'll have an update around then um, and we'll kind of know what next steps need to be taken. So um, depending what happens then, you'll, you might be hearing from me. Um, we'll need some extra support depending on if that vendor rate adjustment is included. So um, keep a lookout for any action alerts or any messaging that might come out for me um, at that point. Um, but yeah, that's kind of all I can really update on the state side for now. Um, on the federal side, I have a more exciting update. So at the end of this month, um, we're going to be going to D.C. for the ABA's lobby days. Um, and we'll be meeting with our members of Congress. So... <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Uh, we'll be taking a team of eight people. So that's including myself, Caitlin, Cesar, and our chair, Care Masters. Um, and that's the first time that we'll be going on this trip in person since 2019. So we're really excited and we're really busy preparing for that. Um, and yeah, that's kind of all we really have for now. Um, hopefully I'll have some more updates for you the next time we meet. Um, but yeah, let me know if you have any questions um, or if you want to connect on anything else. So. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Um, does anyone have any questions? Any follow up? Okay. Um, so we will move on to funding reports. Um, it's my understanding that no one from OCLA is available to attend this meeting today. So there's no, so there will be no state funding report at this meeting. Um, but for the federal funding report, I. Abigail Dakis is, is standing in um, to give the report. Hi, good afternoon. Nope, morning still. Good morning, everyone. Um, so the um, just yesterday, the White House dropped their request um, for the FY 2024 budget, which is 800 million for, um, for uh, 
LSC, and that's a 40% increase from what we did get. Um, I don't know if that signals anything. Um, it's going to be a pretty contentious, um, maybe they all are, but I think we predict that this is going to be a harder year than most. Um, and that's all still compared with LSC's request to really fully fund civil legal aid um, at a million five, no, a billion five. So um, that's the quick update. Um, I'm happy to pop some of the, um, like a quick summary of that in the chat. And if there's any questions, let me know and I will answer or forward it up. Any questions for Abigail about the federal federal funding update um, before we move on? Hearing nothing. Uh, Caitlin, uh, can you give us the LFW update? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. I uh, hope you're having a good Friday. Um, I looked at the, the January minutes and that doesn't, not much has changed since January 27th. I think that does a pretty good job, a pretty, provides a pretty good snapshot of where we're at right now. A couple updates I, I just wanted to throw in though. I want, first of all, I want to thank everyone who was able to come to our Goldmark Award luncheon on February 17th. Again, it was the first time we were able to, you know, get the band back together after a few years of being apart. And it was so lovely to see all of you who were able to attend. And we're also grateful to those of you who could participate remotely. Um, so I uh, wanted to acknowledge that. Um, <clears throat> the, the biggest thing we have going on right now in terms of funding is a new round of race equity grants um, are gonna be made. Um, uh the uh we yesterday we held a webinar for current and future applicants um the the race equity grants advisory panel is going to make 10 forty thousand dollar grants um at its up, upcoming spring meeting and the deadline for applications is april 15th um if you'd like more information or you know want to um get in touch, I suggest going to our website. Oh, look, there's Emily. She just put it in, in there. Um, and you can, can learn more about how to get connected with that program if you don't know yet. Um, and finally, I just wanted to share a, a thanks. Um, for the first time in several years, I, I'm participating on the ATJ Board Conference Planning Committee. Um, and what a delight. It is so great to work with this thoughtful, hardworking group of people. And I'm so excited about the conference. And um, I just wanted to share my appreciation for getting um, to be part of this, this process and this group of people. So um, that's all I've got, unless anyone uh, has any questions. Um, I would, you know, happy to answer anything or otherwise turn it over to my colleague, Melinda. Thanks, Caitlin. Uh, if there are no other questions, um, I have just a couple of good news items to highlight. It's great to be here and see everybody. I want to echo Caitlin's thanks for your help making the gold mark a success this year. It was yet again a new thing for us to do because it was a hybrid event. You know, we were in person in 2020 and then two full virtual. And then this year we tried this hybrid model. So for those of you who watched at home, I hope you have a little patience. I know we had some glitches with that, but we were really thrilled that we had over 830 people participate in the event with 650 people in the room and 100 online. We raised 400,000, so we're maintaining that amazing amount of money from the community to put into the grant making pool at LFW. We loved honoring Michelle Storms. Uh, her speech is up on our website and at the ACLU as well as Twyla Carter's. Uh, those, it just, it, it felt really good. There was some amazing serendipity with Twyla recommending Seattle Clemency Project's first client. Uh, so we just, we really appreciated all of the support in that room for Legal Aid. Uh, a good portion of those funds came from corporate sponsorships. And I just wanted to highlight that. While it's great to have IOLTA numbers way up, we try to add as much unrestricted money as we can into the grant making pool. And while the legal community will always be our number one constituency, we have a lot of room to grow and we're working to expand our donor base into the business and broader social justice community. Right. Um, our other piece of good news, which has already been touched on is that we are super excited to have Laura Berry join the team. 
Uh, as LFW's new annual campaign director, she'll manage all the campaign fundraising programs that you're familiar with, the law firm campaign, associates campaign, and the growing beer and justice events that we hold around the state. Uh, with a background in music and nonprofit arts management, she comes to LFW after a seven year tenure as development director of the Washington State Historical Society and other nonprofit consulting. We're really happy to have her and she's representing Tacoma on the staff too. Uh, and finally, I just wanted to say thanks to all of you. This is gonna be my last ATJ board meeting as I'll be moving on to new adventures after eight years at LFW and the endowment. It's been a pleasure and an honor working with all of you to increase access to justice. And I'm sure I'll see you around and in the community. Thank you. Let me know if you have any questions about campaign fundraising. Thank you, Melinda, for your update. and. Um, and thank you for thank you for your service working with LFW. Um, public meetings. It doesn't have to be your last ATJ board meeting. You can keep coming if you want to. <laughs> That's right. Oh, what I meant to say, yeah, the campaign is super excited about sponsoring its event that it always does at the conference. So we can't wait to see that agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, well, um, I should always chair because we are, we cruise through that agenda and um, it's free for all for if, if folks have other updates or announcements that they want to make to the group. Uh, the floor is open. I should note, Terry is a wonderful chair. I'm, I'm just, I'm very glad to be able to, to stand in for him today. <laughs> No announcements? Oh, Abigail. Hi, I, I saw Bryn come on. It made me think I should put on my fundraising hat for um, Benefits Law Center, who's having their Spring into Action event on um, Friday the 31st at Optimism Brewing. If you're in Seattle, um, it should be a fun, low key, exciting couple of small fundraising items, but some fun um, fellowship with folks at Optimism on Friday evening, March 31st. Um, in advance of that, there are a couple of great webinars planned um, to get folks thinking about um, trauma informed care and working with social security um, issues. So um, look on BLC's website for more information. You know what? Or I'll pop it in the chat. Thanks, Abby. Um, any other announcements that folks want to make? Now's your time, captive audience. All right. I think that um, I think that's it for today for for the month for this meeting at least. Um, thank you everyone. Have a wonderful day.